back in the early 70s, I saw something that I will never be able to fully understand and will certainly never forget. I was just a teen at the time, and even now, I can still vividly see him. Growing up on the Jersey Shore, we spent a lot of our time on the beaches and in the water. There would be an occasional shark sighting now and again, and the beaches would be closed off. But it never lasted for long, and certainly, on the stretch of beach we frequented, there weren't any actual attacks. Of course, that didn't mean that the sharks weren't out there, or that they weren't killing other things in the ocean. And sometimes, we'd run down to the shore after school let out, and find all sorts of half-eaten creatures that had washed up after Sharky had finished with their snack. Being teens, we were more morbidly fascinated rather than grossed out by it. It was often more a case of what was the sickest looking thing we could find. And I'm pretty sure the octopus that washed up with each of its tentacles bitten off halfway was one of the closest times I came to losing my lunch. But despite all of this, we never actually ever saw a shark. I wish we had, because what we did see one day, back in the early 70s, was way more frightening than any great white shark. And to this day, I have no idea exactly what it was. It was the end of summer, and it was evening time. Now, you may well have gotten an image in your head of the boardwalk, and the places in Jersey which are heaving with tourists, and I apologize if I was misleading, as this particular area I'm referring to, where we used to hang out, wasn't so much private, but it was a bit more off the beaten track, so only locals tended to visit, which was fine by us, as oftentimes it was just there. Anyway, so, it was late summer, late evening, but not yet night, so it was getting dark, but we could still see okay. And what we saw, I'm just going to come out and say it. We saw a gator man, or as I describe it later on, because we're not the only people to see this thing, a humanoid alligator. I was real grateful. I had some buddies with me at the time. Not just because it scared the crap out of me, but so I could prove I wasn't lying or hallucinating or something. After all, it was the 70s, so I'm pretty sure a lot of people were still using acid or smoking weed. But to be clear, we were not. In fact, we were all sober, and had been. Hell, my dad was a cop. He'd have beaten me black and blue if I ever did a drug. So, there were four of us, all completely sober, and we all saw this gator man. The best way I can describe him is he looked like a real tall alligator. Like, instead of having those tiny squat little limbs, so it looks like they're wandering about on their belly, it had arms and legs, the size and length of a person but still covered in scales with claws, and a full of gator head with that long snout and huge teeth. It had reared up out of nowhere, in the ocean, but close enough for us to be able to see it. I think the water came up to like where its knees would have been. I have no idea what it did then, or where it went off to, because you can bet your bottom dollar that we ran out of there as fast as we possibly could and did not look back. There were quite a few sightings of him that summer, enough for us to believe that it wasn't some sort of hallucination. But then he disappeared. What he was, why he was there, I'll never know, but I'll never forget him. When I was in college, I took a road trip with my roommate back to her home in Ohio for Thanksgiving. It was a long drive, to say the least, but the promise of a week of home cooking 
and free laundry was more than enough to make the journey worth it. My roommate was a lot of fun and came from a huge family, most of which I'd be meeting over the next few days. So, the trip went by fairly quickly as she joyously told me the various stories featuring Uncle Lenny or her cousin Susie. We made sure to take plenty of rest stops and even had lunch at a mom and pop's roadside diner. We texted her mom whenever we had bars or service to let her know our progress. Things were going great. Then, we came to this strip of highway that looked like it hadn't been used in decades. It was like something straight out of a serial killer movie, and we laughed and joked about finding a broken down car on the side of the road. A Bundy-esque dude just waiting to club us over the head. Of course, since I'm writing into you to tell you this story, you know that didn't happen. Also, you talk about cryptid monsters and not humans. Anyway, whilst we were laughing and planning on how we would escape and be final girls, we did see something on the side of the road. But it was Bundy or BTK, obviously. This thing seemed much smaller than a person to start with. And as we got closer, at first, we presumed to be it was some kind of dog. I don't know why, to be honest, because even as we were approaching it, I could tell that it appeared to be a greenish color, and dogs don't tend to be that sort of shade. It also appears to stand up, because we could see legs. So, and we still are a little bit away. It looks like we are approaching something smallish, maybe around four feet tall, standing upright on two legs, and green. I can very distinctly remember that as we drove past it, as we were literally eye to eye looking at it out of the passenger window. Neither of us said a word. We were both completely silent for a good five to 10 minutes afterwards. My roomie did not slow down at all, but she didn't speed up either. We just kept rolling. Finally, I do remember folding my hands onto my lap and staring straight ahead out the windshield. Not looking at my buddy, I simply said, did you just see that really tall frog standing up like a person? She then burst out in what seemed like a relieved laughter and exclaimed yes. We both had a nervous laugh for a bit. And to be honest, I'm not too sure that either of us could fully quite comprehend exactly what we had just driven past. I mean, it's not exactly an everyday occurrence to see Mr. Toad from Wind in the Willows stood by the side of the road, is it? Of course, this guy wasn't dressed in clothes that would be ridiculous. But he was like the size of a human child, and he was most definitely upright, on two bowed legs, not crouched down, ready to jump on all four, like a regular frog would. It honestly went through my mind that maybe we had been poisoned or drugged by the coffee at the diner, because it couldn't possibly be real. But if we were, then we showed no other signs or symptoms. So what the hell did we see? Is there really a species of tall two-legged frogs roaming the highways out here in Ohio? Was he trying to hitchhike? We'll never know. But we still often think about that frog man and what he is up to these days. I mean, after all, I think there was a pretty large swamp or marshland nearby. Either way, we try to make jokes about it, but it's still freaky because we both saw the exact same thing. I work in the mailroom for a huge corporate business. The hours are long, tedious and repetitive, but the paycheck is good and the company I am down there, even better. To keep ourselves from going mad, we often tell each other stories. Since we're all over 18, we will often try and freak each other out. 
despite the business being worth millions. The mailroom is still a bit of a throwback, and although our working area is fine, and the break room and bathrooms are clean, there are still a few old, dark, and dingy storage areas down there. I see myself as a bit of a master storyteller, and had been busy memorizing a much long creepypasta as I could find to keep the mantle of King of Creepy going as I possibly could. Urban legends, crappy remakes and sequels to movies that no one had ever watched, so they didn't know how the plotline went. I loved it. As soon as my shift started, I had people begging me to tell them more and more spooky stuff. So, in a way, it was typical that what happened down in one of those dark, damp and dingy storerooms happened to me, as literally no one believed me. They all thought it was just another one of my stories, or that I was setting them up for a prank. But I wasn't. As I have already mentioned, the actual warehouse part where we spent most of our time, and the parts of the building that we used for breaks, was absolutely fine and had been fitted out with damp proofing, AC in the summer, heaters in the winter. But, shut away down various old corridors was the oldest part of the building, where you only went once in a blue moon if you needed something specific. And it just so happened that a fuse had blown in the plug for the microwave, and, me being me, volunteered to head down to one of the rooms designated as a random storage, as I was sure that I had seen a box of batteries and other stuff down there. It had been raining non-stop for the last week or so, and it smelled even damper than usual the further I headed. There was obviously electricity down there, and lighting, just no heat, so it always smelled kind of rusty and a thick must. The walls even felt damp sometimes. The closer I got to the room, I thought that I could hear a sort of snuffling noise. I'm sure by now you figured I probably don't scare easy, but I still didn't want to come face to face with a rat, since they carry all sorts of nasty diseases. So, although not scared, I had my guard up, just in case. I did have my favorite work boots on, and I was a mean kicker especially during school football. The noise got louder as I approached the door of the storeroom. It almost sounded wet, like something swallowing. It's really hard to describe. I threw open the door, my leg out in front of me, ready to kick or stomp on something. I don't know. It just felt like I needed to be ready for something. I pulled on the cord for the light, and the moment the room was illuminated, I saw it. And I will tell you exactly what I saw the best that I can. It was big. Not as big as me. But then, I'm only 6'4", and not many people are. But I figured it was easily over 5 feet. Whatever this was, was standing upright, on two legs just like you or me. It had very tiny arms that it held in front of itself. Not long, except it was at the side. It was very dark green, grainy looking, and scaly. I can 100% say that it looked lizard-like, because it had a very lizard head and face. It had a very long lizard mouth, and even a nose that looked very lizardy big, bugged-out yellow eyes on either side of its huge face. It looked freaky, but not necessarily fierce. This thing stood about 15 feet away from me, and was a small man-sized two-footed lizard. I was convinced I was looking at some sort of alien, some sort of lizard alien. It looked at me, and I looked at him, or her, or it. It was androgynous. I'm saying him, I have no damn idea what sex it was. I slowly backed out and slammed the door. I ran back to the mailroom and told the others what I'd seen. I was met with an eruption of laughter. 
clapped him on my back, and offered high fives. A couple of them said they believed me, and came back down to the room to see for themselves. But of course, nothing. So it went down as a great prank. Another super story. Only I know what I saw. How it got down there, I have no idea. I know there are old windows on the far side of that storage room that could easily fit a large person through. But those haven't been messed with in a long time. And there are thick forests and woods surrounding the outside of this unit. Who knows? Do I really believe this thing came through the window and was stalking and waiting for the right time in that room? Not really. But I can't think of another reason why this thing was there. My granddad was a sailor, and he used to tell us all sorts of crazy stuff that he saw in the sea. In fact, a lot of the time, he would have a twinkle in his eye and the ghost of a smile as he told us, like the time he supposedly met Blackbeard the pirate, or discovered an underwater city of gold. But there was one story that no matter how many times he retold it, I never saw that twinkle, and that makes me think of the stuff he used to make up to entertain us. This particular tale was true to my belief. They were somewhere near the Caribbean when it happened. Now, before anybody jumps to conclusions, my grandfather has now been dead for at least 20 years. I heard this story when I was around 10, so that's 30 years ago and it happened when he was younger than I am now. So he was not inspired by or retelling of a famous movie featuring Jack Sparrow. He and the crew had been aboard the ship for around a week or so, and everything was going well. They were well on track for whatever their end destination was, and in good spirits. Most of the men at the time were below deck, doing what sailors do. That's when a large splash was heard. A very large splash. Not remotely unusual when you're in the middle of the ocean, of course. But something told him to look out over the side of the ship. At first, he couldn't see what manner of creature was responsible for the sound, but he could see ripples in the water below. He seemed to recall it was around dusk, so although the blazing sun wasn't high in the sky, it was by no means completely dark yet. He also wasn't in the slightest bit frightened, merely curious, as if it were somehow playing with him. The creature refused to come back up to the surface whilst he was watching. He could see bubbles, so he knew something was down there. A lot of the sea life he had encountered were quite nosy, and he'd seen many dolphins, and even an octopus come right up to the ship, as if to say, what are you doing in my ocean? Knowing these things can be playful, he stepped back from the side of the ship, so his sightline of the water was obscured. And sure enough, as soon as he had moved back, he heard two loud splashes again, and a bang, and something bumped up against the bottom of the ship. Still not thinking it was anything that would be a potential threat, he raced back over to try and catch a glimpse. And he was rewarded by catching sight of the very end of a vibrant aqua green tail fin diving back under the water. He remembers thinking that it was the most beautiful color. And also, what on earth must be the fish that the tail fin was on. By now, his curiosity had peaked, but was still not afraid. Backing away slowly, he made sure he was out of sight. But this time, he crept quietly to the edge of the ship so that it could pop up instantly and see what was down there. Maybe he discovered a new breed of fish. As I said, he was curious and now excited to see exactly what was playing hide-and-seek with him. He heard a bump and a splash, and this time, 
shot up as quick as he could to look over the side. As I have said, whenever Granddad told us about meeting Long Zhong Silver or surviving a battle with a Kraken, we knew he was full of it, embellishing things to entertain us. He'd get really animated as he told us, and it often ended up with him making us jump and then smothering us in kisses. But I swear, when he told us this, there was none of that. If you can believe it, he actually paled, and there was a slight tremor to his voice. That was because this time, when he looked over, he did catch a fleeting glance of what was playing with him. It was a mermaid. Don't be fooled for one second that this thing had anything in common with Ariel. The best way that he was able to describe its body was that it looked like Nosferatu with long hair, a gnarled bony body, and a fin. Can you even imagine that? Nosferatu's twisted features with huge warped fangs, wide gaping eyes, but instead of a bald head, long straggly wet hair covered and thick in seaweed. Then, instead of a human body, the rancid, almost concave bony structure with visible ribs and two shriveled, wrinkled chest bones. The only thing to indicate properly that it was indeed a creature of another world. The only thing similar to the Disney film was her fin, which was indeed quite beautiful, and the scale shimmered in the setting sun. Of course, as soon as the creature realized it had been seen, it dove back under the water and never resurfaced. Granddad said, of course, they all knew the legends of sirens who were meant to be beautiful enchantresses who lured sailors with their beauty and song and then usually killed them and ate them. If that had been a siren, then it must have taken a very drunk or desperate man to succumb. Whatever it was, it absolutely terrified my father and my granddad. He never saw anything like it again. But a year or so after that, he stopped sailing permanently and swore to always stay on land from then on out. Thanks for hearing my story. My determination to never own a car is what ultimately led up to the building blocks of this very story. I can't afford to completely live off the grid, but I do everything I can to distance myself from life of dependence. You know, I don't use money unless I have to. I won't be caught dead using a bank. I earn only as much money as I'll have to use. Everything else I try to accomplish with my own two hands. The system wants to shackle these hands. Your hands too. I think it's because of the determination to resist that I ended up having this encounter in the first place. Some of the money that I can't do without is my bus fare. I will not own a vehicle. So, I need to get to where I'm going with the buses that are always crawling all over Manhattan. It's not a bad way to do things. It beats being tied down to a payment and repairs and maintenance costs. Gosh, and freaking insurance. So, when you're taking the bus as often as I, you get to know the patterns of the faces of the people that you see. You get a feel for who works in the morning, or who has errands to run in the afternoon, or who the night workers are. Just for the hay of it, I began taking different buses, just to see the different crowds. It took me several runs to see it, but I began to catch on to that no matter which bus I was on. There was always one person that always was there with me. He was an old man that looked like an old woman if you didn't look close enough. He looked a little on the homeless side, a little on the mentally ill side. He looked a little on every side. A virtual human kaleidoscope with an oversized cowboy hat that's been crushed more than once. A Hawaiian shirt 
that was usually unbuttoned, and pink shorts and sneakers. He was always carrying some variation of paper or plastic shopping bags. He never smiled and never really made eye contact with anyone. You'd think somebody that loud would stand out right away. But I can't describe the way he always kind of blended in with everything. I mean, he was so out there. He was ordinary. Anyway, no matter which bus I took, there was at some point a crazy idea beginning to form in the back of my head that would not be ignored. I got the notion that he was following me. So, I was going to follow him back. The first few times I tailed him, I really didn't think he was aware of me, but I've been doing things long enough to know the revelation comes with persistence. He would stay on the bus for several cycles to the route, as if it were a means of sightseeing. But then, he would get off at a stop and sit down and wait for another bus. Then, he'd ride that one through its route several times. I don't think I ever observed him stopping to use the bathroom anywhere. He just kept going. My bladder and bowels would always seem to scream before his did. Things came to a head that day, and I had finally given up and decided that he was just a derelict old man that had nothing better to do with his twilight years than surf the mass transit system the way most people of later generations surf the internet. Well, then he got off of the downtown junction, where all the routes converged at once. He got off the bus, waited for another one, got on. I kid you not, no more than 10 minutes later, a completely different bus arrived and the same guy got off, waited, got on. Either those buses did some serious moving in 10 minutes, or something else was up. I did some acid back in my younger days, and I started to wonder if those permanent tendencies towards flashbacks were a culprit. But the notion started to gel in my head that there was one of him on every single bus at any given time. The more I shadowed him, the more I watched how often the buses would trade him at the junction that became the only viable explanation. I started going to ridiculous lengths, working longer hours so I could have more money to buy those little micro cams that are so cheap nowadays. I could collect footage from different buses. I know that sounds crazy, but the way we're kept asleep and oblivious to all this stuff is even crazier. Catching on to this was just part of the way I was becoming awakened. Sure enough, he was everywhere. Nobody else was everywhere, just him. He never met himself. His movements were perfectly coordinated so that two of him would never be seen in the same place at the same time. I couldn't think of any purpose this arrangement would serve until it hit me while I was relocating one of my cameras. Surveillance. He they were somebody's eyes and ears it would be too obvious if it were the bus driver put it up to somebody that is so ordinary and so quiet that nobody gives them a second look i felt woke in that moment i felt empowered i had all the footage i needed to make my case and put together like a documentary all i needed was something involving a confrontation candid footage of me calling him out without giving him a chance to rehearse. I made my move at one of the times that he was at the downtown junction very early on in the morning when he was really the only person there. I came on strong, like I might know even more than I was letting on. His eyes roamed me up and down, like some sort of mechanical scan. I became aware of a hissing sound that coincided with his breathing. He looked me in the eyes, but then somehow looked into me. I felt invaded, like he could see me without my clothes on. My vision tunneled, and he was at the focus of it all. Then, 
his lips moved and made some series of syllables that I couldn't derive words from. Green scales appeared on his skin, as if they had been retracted inside of his pores or something. A long tongue even darted out between his lips and wagged at me, and he made the first facial expression I had ever seen on him. A sinister grin, revealing multiple pointed jagged teeth. Then, I felt like I was hit in the face with a sledgehammer. I woke up, underneath one of the small trees surrounding the downtown junction. I didn't know how long I was out, but it felt late. I wasn't missing anything. I had one of the cams in the breast pocket of my hoodie when he turned snake-like in front of me. I thought I was going to strike a big one in the name of Woke. But when I got my cams and stuff home, they had been wiped. All footage I'd ever taken just showed white noise. What's more, all of his copies disappeared, and I never saw him or anyone like him again. I have heard about snake people being in the upper areas of business and government, but I got a serious chill thinking about what they would want by taking their game all the way down to the bottom watching over ordinary people like me that blow in and out of the wind like litter. Are they keeping tabs on all of us that closely? And what kind of voodoo was it that knocked me out? A spoken word cut my lights out. Maybe that's how they work. Maybe that's part of how they hide in the broad daylight. They don't just blend in. They got some kind of voodoo magic going on. I don't know like some sort of supernatural power. Look out if you keep seeing someone familiar on public transportation. They might just be a sleeper cell, waiting, listening, watching. I remember in fifth grade, we got a substitute teacher that stayed much longer than any sub should have. She was large and loud, and the only part of her that wasn't ridiculously big was her feet. Her thighs were like freak of nature beets that had slender roots for her to walk on. We kept asking her when Mrs. Wimmer was gonna come back. She would just tell us soon enough, but we lost track of how long our real teacher was absent. It had to have been weeks. One day, she told us that we're going to watch a film so amazing that we would watch it for the duration of the day, breaking only for lunch and recess. I had no idea what kind of film would run for so long. Just before she started up the film, I had to get up and use the bathroom. I should have asked for permission, but it hit me so hard that I couldn't risk a no. When I got back, the television rack was already in front of the class, and white static filled the screen. Those of you old enough to remember those days know that meant the video was starting soon. But the video never started. I stared, patiently waiting for the black leader of the first few inches of film to be read. It never did. While I was waiting, everyone in the classroom burst out into laughter. It died down. It was as if something funny had happened on the TV. It happened again. I looked into the static with confusion. There was nothing there. No sound, nothing. It was one of those screens that were rounded. Such were the old makes. In a corner, I saw a reflection of the lamp at the teacher's desk, and the teacher's face lit up by it. And the reflection distorted all kinds of ways was something that made me catch my breath once I worked it out. Something just as scaly and hideous as a crocodile was sitting at that desk. I whirled around to see the very human teacher sitting behind the desk, but she was looking straight at me, and the eyes I saw then were the same eyes I saw in the corner of the TV screen reflection there was more laughter around me from everybody, and the teacher smiled, a very evil, sinister smile. 
I feigned illness for as long as possible until my act fell apart. By then, weeks later, there wasn't a classroom to go back to. One of my classmates went on to do extremely violent acts. His excuse was that the teacher had taught him both through lessons and through videos that it was the right thing to do. As far as I know, that substitute teacher was never known of. I've used Google and white pages and all else using what little information about her I could find. It's like tracking down a ghost or a chameleon that disappears into the background. Either way, seeing that crocodile of a person left me terrified and I have no idea if she came from this earth or another planet or the pits of hell itself. All I know is that it, assuming that's what it was, disguised itself as a person because its intentions were not the same 